we are going to, in some ways, end the way that we started by looking at history. We have always maintained that understanding the historical precedents of character assassination and potentially cancel culture are important for analyzing what's happening in the world today. And as you all know, we have identified uh, character assassination in every society and in every historical era that we have looked for it. So um, a lot of this discourse is not new. Um, and so our last panel, panel eight today, is going to look at character assassination and cancel culture in history. So think back to some of the ideas that Martin introduced us to yesterday morning, and maybe we'll see some of those themes come back. Um, so our first panelist for panel eight is Tyler Johnson from the University of Oklahoma. And his presentation is entitled A Little Bit More Than the Law Will Allow, Biography, History, and Attitudes Towards Memorials to Robert E. Lee. Um, I'm gonna set a timer for about 20 minutes and I'll pop in with a, a two minute warning. But otherwise, Tyler, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you everyone for allowing me to present. And uh, you know, maybe my presentation here is going to be a bridge between some of these recent panels and uh, the topic of panel eight here, because I'm looking at modern cancellation, and that might be a sort of a loaded word in this context, of historical figures. Uh, my, my work here today is the fruit or the natural progression of some work that I'd done a few years ago uh, that was published back in 2019 in a journal called PS Political Science and Politics on um, memorial removal and deliberative democracy. This idea that we've seen a good number of monuments to the Confederacy removed over the past few years, but a lot of this removal has been done via elected boards or almost by fiat, where mayors and governors are just sort of ordering these things to be removed, and then they're willing to take the legal heat. Um, doesn't always happen very quickly, um, but they just say, let's do this, and we'll see where the cards fall afterward. And, and the research that I had done uh, sort of illustrated that the public would like more of a voice when it comes to this decision-making process, that even if you thought memorials should stay, if public opinion was in favor of them being removed, you're a little bit more okay with the idea of being removed because it was sort of a majoritarian decision. Uh, this sort of got me thinking about, well, you know, if citizens want their voices to be heard on this issue, what constitutes these voices? Where do these opinions come from? And how can these opinions be changed? Now, we tend to think of memorials to the Confederacy as being a Southern thing in the US context. But as you're gonna see in this presentation, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, there are memorials to the Confederate States of America in places you would not expect. Uh, and also it's not as if this was just something that sort of popped up immediately post-Civil War. You know, Civil War ends in 1865 and all these memorials are going up in 1866. This is not the case. Uh, it's been 150 years plus of these memorials just sort of popping up and becoming part of the landscape. You know, the trends are heading toward these memorials sort of slowly disappearing, but that's not necessarily something that's motivated by public opinion, as you'll see here in a few moments as well. And I also want to share with you or to get you thinking about the idea of a memorial as being broader than just a statue. Um, that might be the first thing that comes to mind. And you know, I sort of carefully use the word memorial in this research uh, because it's not always a monument like this. So this might be the stereotype of what we think of when we think of a memorial to someone, a statue, this one on a pedestal, we will revisit this, this memorial in a few moments here, but you know, a, more, a memorial can be you're driving down the highway and you exit on the Lee Jackson Memorial Highway. Well, that's a memorial to, to Confederate soldiers. These things are part of the American landscape. A memorial can be a school board deciding to name 
an elementary school after uh, a former Confederate soldier. And here the mascot as well is the home of the rebels. And we've got the sort of buff looking uh, soldier there as, as the mascot of this elementary school. There's a certain irony in the fact that US Army bases, a handful of them are named after uh, former Confederates as well. But you know, this is a memorial to the Confederacy. Uh, for those of you who were children of the late 1970s and early 1980s in the United States of America, uh, this is a memorial to the Confederacy. The television show Dukes of Hazard, which was on for five years or so, you know, these were, were uh, according to the lyrics of the theme song, good old boys never mean and no harm. And they're driving around in a car called the General Lee with the Confederate stars and bars on, on the roof. So, you know, these memorials are, can be pervasive throughout life. Uh, if we just sort of open our eyes and, and, and take a look, and, you know, if you recognize the names and you have to engage, if, you're, if, you, if you live in, in Richmond where that statue once was or in many other places across the country, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, you might be forced to engage with these sorts of memorials. And, you know, a lot of the conversation that's taken place about these in the past few years has been the fact that this engagement could cause a good amount of pain. Uh, especially for the African-American community in the United States. Um, but there's been a good deal of controversy surrounding removing these memorials. And we're gonna sort of dig into that controversy here in, in a few moments. You know, some states have passed laws to block their removal. Uh, people have decided to take removal into their own hands. If you're not going to formally pull these things down, then we're going to use our hands and use tools to do it on our own. As I mentioned a few moments ago, uh, these things aren't as old as we might think. There was a real push in the early 20th century by groups like the Daughters of the Confederacy and other uh, veterans groups to think about how to memorialize the Old South outside of the Old South. And that leads to a world in which these memorials aren't really where we think as well here. So you can look at a map like this. This map is a little bit outdated, but you know, the bulk of these things are in what we would consider to be the South, you know, states that seceded from the Union in 1861. But you'll see that they move into states that were border states at the time. And on occasion, you see them in states that were part of the North and in territory or in states that were territories during the Civil War. So Montana here in the Northwest United States, uh, not even a state until 1889, 24 years after the end of the Civil War, but there's a memorial to the Confederacy in that state. Uh, you know, something else we want to keep in mind is the fact that these memorials pop up in places that sort of defy the politics of the issue in modern times. So here's another uh, map that someone created here. You know, the fact that the city of Los Angeles had to go through a Confederate or a monument removal crisis and controversy is fascinating to think about given the politics of Los Angeles. But you see places like Madison, Wisconsin and Brooklyn, New York and Boston, Massachusetts. And these aren't places where we think we'd find memorials to the Confederacy, but they were there or are there and they've been there for a while. You know, the past five to six years, there has been a, a good deal more conversation about how did these things end up where they are? What were their origins? How do they make people feel who encounter them? And what's the future going to be? So do we leave them in place? Do we remove them? If we remove them, you know, do they end up in a junkyard? Do they end up in a museum? Does some wealthy patron decide they're gonna build some sort of Confederate theme park? Things like that, kind of like that have happened. Um, so what is the future of, of these sorts of, of monuments? Yeah, there was a broader debate about Confederate iconography in the late 1990s and early 2000s. A lot of states in the South had the Confederate battle flag elements, the stars and bars on their state flags. So flying over courthouses and federal buildings and so forth. 
And there was a real push to get these states to change their flags. There was even a sort of financial pressure put on a lot of these states. The NCAA, for example, uh, threatened boycotts of states. They wouldn't allow for uh, national collegiate athletic tournaments to be held in states that kept these flags in place. Uh, but the real motivating or crucial events that have driven this modern conversation on this issue have been uh, moments like the, uh, the Emanuel AME church shooting in Charleston, South Carolina in 2015. So we've seen a lot of, of instances where uh, you have a, a hate crime that pushes for reconsideration of monuments like these. Uh, you know, there's a direct link between this church shooting in this African-American church in 2015 and the mayor of New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, starting the push to remove uh, these Confederate monuments from a prominent square in, in the downtown of the city, which ended up happening uh, about a year and a half or so later. The famous Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia in August, 2017, uh, often noted as motivation for uh, cities and states to start pulling these things down. And of course, the sustained pressure of the Black Lives Matter movement across the past few years after instances of police brutality, especially in the summer of 2020, uh, really pushed a lot of places to reconsider the placement of these memorials. So you could take, for example, this, this uh, statue of Robert E. Lee on horseback in this circle in Richmond, Virginia. This is how it was for many, many years. This is what it ended up looking like uh, during the summer of 2020. It became a meeting place for protesters. It became a visible depiction of their frustration. You can even see there's a basketball hoop in the lower left corner. So people are sort of meeting here and socializing here. And you know, it became a very visible signal of the frustration people felt with police brutality and uh, treatment of African-Americans over the past few years. And you know, between the time where I proposed the abstract for this conference and the presentation today, uh, as you can see here, this statue comes off the pedestal. So we have the empty pedestal alluded to in the title of this presentation. We've got these empty pedestals all across the country. These are visible signs that change is possible. You know, with all this change that's taking place, you'd think, well, public opinion must be moving in this direction and elected officials are just sort of riding the crest of this. But a lot of recent surveys have shown that the public is really mixed on this topic. There was a morning consult poll uh, taken just about two months ago that showed only about a third of Americans are for taking these sorts of memorials down and about half of Americans say they should stay, stay where they are and the motivations behind that might be well, uh, you, you support these monuments or you think they just might be like history, you know, we should keep it there as a history lesson so that people learn from uh, the problematic nature of the people being memorialized. Uh, you know, the goal of this research is to sort of think about why is opinion the way it is and what sort of arguments might shift opinion. And as you'll see across the presentation here, uh, where we are as a nation can play a role in how people think about this issue. And I do this um, through the lens of how biographical and historical information might motivate people to think differently on this topic. There's a lot of research on people's opinions on Confederate memorials, but a lot of it is qualitative in nature. Um, it tends to focus on you know, people who want these things removed, believe they should be removed because uh, they celebrate traitors. Uh, these memorials remind people of the legacy of slavery. Uh, something that I'm gonna be talking about with the survey experimental research I present here in a moment is the idea that it's sort of the confluence of these two ideas, but we're honoring people who were personally terrible on the issue of race and slavery. And so what I've done is think about this in terms of, you know, when I introduced myself on Friday morning, I described myself as taking a sort of survey experimental approach to the, the questions we're, we're tackling here. Um, and I'm focused on like the, how 
aspects of those arguments I mentioned a few moments ago might push people to think we should remove these memorials. And because Confederate General Robert E. Lee is quite possibly the most memorialized of these Confederates, that's the lens through which I conduct my survey research here. So uh, a little, close to two years ago, I conducted a nationally representative survey via Qualtrics. And what I did was take my pool of survey respondents and break them down into four groups. Uh, one of these groups is a control group and they just answered a bunch of demographic and political questions. And also I posed a bunch of removal scenarios and said, do you support this? or are you against this? You'll see the questions in a moment here. With the other three groups, I gave them a little bit of information and then asked them those questions on removal. So I asked them to read a little bit more on Robert E. Lee or some information related to Lee or the Civil War, just to sort of see what types of information might uh, get people to think a little, a little bit differently on this topic. And you'll see this information in a few moments here. But the survey questions I was focused on in this research capture a bunch of different dynamics related to the arguments on removal. So a statue of Lee stands in the US Capitol Statuary Hall. So this is sort of one of the most prominent uh, honorifics that an American can receive. There are only sort of a limited number of these statues in the US Capitol. Uh, should the statue stay where it is or be removed and replaced? Fort Lee, which I brought up a few moments ago, named after Robert E. Lee. Should this army post keep its name or be renamed? An elementary school in Alabama, this is an actual school. Um, should it be keep its name or be renamed? And finally, here's a school in San Diego, California that was renamed to the uh, sort of perfectly bland Pacific View Leadership Elementary School. Um, do you think they were correct in changing the name or were they wrong in changing the name? And with these two questions here, you know, they both capture elementary schools, but my goal here was one, let's think about something that happened in the past versus something that could happen in the future. And two, let's get people thinking about, well, here's a school in the former Confederacy. So maybe we might have different feelings about that than a memorial in a place where we wouldn't think there would be one. Okay, this is a wall of text here. You do not have to read it. Don't even try. I'm going to summarize it for you. So I said a few moments ago here that I'm breaking these survey respondents down into different groups. So you've got three out of the four groups read this information, which is just a straightforward biography of Robert E. Lee. This is compressing Wikipedia down into a paragraph. So it touches on like who he is and his military career, just sort of signaling, hey, this guy was a Confederate, it's a power con powerful Confederate, a prominent Confederate. And it sort of gives his history throughout the Civil War here and pre-Civil War. You know, this is the sort of thing you might learn if you were an elementary school student uh, reading a textbook on who was Robert E. Lee. So three out of the four groups got that. One out of the four groups got that biography and this very specific uh, extra bit of information on the South and slavery. So this idea that uh, slavery is uh, a motivation for the Civil War, Confederates were looking to protect slavery. Here's the Vice President of the Confederacy saying that uh, slavery is the natural and moral condition of these slaves as well. And here's a big you know, round number of the number of, of slaves in the former United States. So one group gets this biography, and this extra information. The fourth group gets this biography and they get this bit of information, which is that Lee personally, extremely problematic views on race and slavery. So Tyler, I'm sorry to interrupt, about two minutes left. Okay, so there's this idea in uh, Confederate iconography that, well, like Lee was one of the good guys. You know, he fought on the side of the South, but hey, on race, he was better. Uh, there's a lot of data that sort of goes against that. But uh, so the last fourth of the survey respondents got the biography in this. Um, if you want to take a look at my, my tables at some point, uh, I'll let you do so. But the sort of key takeaway from this research here is that the information that is most powerful when it comes to motivating people to remove Confederate statues is the ability to not only know who Robert E. Lee was, 
but to learn that he was personally bad on the issue of race. The other pieces of information don't have significant effects on removal, but this one works every time. And it not only works when I ask this survey or when I conduct the survey in October, 2019, but when I repeat this survey process after the murder of George Floyd, after the summer of 2020, and all the Black, Black Lives Matter protests, it's significant across the board again. Uh, so this is the sort of information that seems to have a clear significant effect in the direction of removal. Um, one last thing, and then I will sort of cede the floor to other folks here is, in the 2019 survey, when you look at demographics and politics, so all of these models have you know, gender, race, sexual orientation, rural, urban questions, party ID, ideology, and so forth. All that stuff is like, it's pretty insignificant and there are no patterns in it. But when you ask these questions in the, in, in the late summer of 2020, all of a sudden ideology, Trump support and age are significant across the board and in the direction you'd expect. So it looks like the, the, the Black Lives Matter protests following the, the, the murder of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police were a sort of real galvanizing and clarifying effect when it came to how conservatives, Trump supporters, and old people feel about Confederate removal. In all of those instances, they're significantly against memorial removal in a way that they weren't a year earlier in August 2019. One last thing, there are no real clear patterns when it comes to comparing these surveys in terms of the impact of that uh, Lee personally bad on slavery uh, treatment. The, the, they're anywhere from like 10 and a half to 15 percentage points higher in favor of removal, but it's not clear that like August, 2020, the, the treatment is more powerful than October, 2019. So, I'll take questions uh, later on, but if anyone has any questions they wanna personally direct toward me, uh, Tyler Johnson at ou.edu is the way to get a hold of me. And thank you so much for the opportunity to share this research. Excellent, thank you so much, Tyler. That's really fascinating and really striking data that you came up with there at the end. So in some ways, Tyler's presentation is a good way of thinking about the way that we grapple with the past and the present. Now we're going to sort of go all the way back into the past itself. So Henri von Nispen is going to talk about the defamation of Caligula. So I will turn the floor over to him and we will pop back to Florian um, after. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and greetings to all of you. I'll try to share my presentation on the defamation of Caius Caligula. Thank you for attending this uh, short presentation. For those who are not familiar with Caligula, I shall begin with the way in which this young Roman ruler was depicted by ancient historians. Next, we turn our attention to one of these authors, the Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria, because his defamation of Caligula was highly effective. And I shall try to demonstrate this by following the five pillars model as explained in this textbook. And then I conclude by suggesting that Philo's strong invective was motivated by one particularly critical aspect in what actually was a clash of cultures. Now, having no military experience or political experience, by the way, Caligula, aged 24, became emperor of the Roman Empire thanks to the support of the Praetorian Guard that was the only military force allowed in Italy. And he became the first emperor to be formally granted unlimited power. Less than four years after his accession, he was assassinate, assassinated by members of the military and the same elite that who had given him such dominance. And shortly after the murder, the character murder began. Caligula is depicted as a perverted, insane psychopath. And this is the image one finds in the work of the Roman Senator Suetonius who wrote almost a century after Caligula's death. 
And the Caligula of Suetonius is a sadistic monster who enjoyed blood, torture, humiliation, and his cruelty was unheard of. He ordered his men to collect shells as spoils of the ocean, intended to make his horse a consul, committed incest with all of his sisters, and he demanded to be worshipped as a living God. And it was especially this last aspect that motivated the first attacker, the Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria. Philo's book, The Embassy to Gaius, is a fierce attack on a young ruler depicted as a theomaniac, severely suffering from delusions of grandeur, who thought of himself as a living God. Although very little is known about Philo's life, he was born in Alexandria, Egypt, around 20 to 10 BCE, and died there around 50. He was a scion of a wealthy family, thoroughly educated in Greek literature, philosophy, and Jewish scripture. And he was also a key figure in Alexandrian politics. And things got seriously out of hand when violent trouble arose in Alexandria, with the Greek Alexandrians attacking the Jewish community and setting fire to the synagogue. With no solution in sight, both parties sent delegations to Rome to argue their cause in front of Caligula. And Philo was chosen to lead the Jewish party. Philo's delegation met the emperor twice. The first time they wove to each other at a distance. The second time when all the Jews were in a terrible shock. Whereas it was the main objective of the Jewish party to keep their religious freedom and gain civic rights in Alexandria, Caligula had ordered to convert the Jerusalem temple into a shrine for his cult. So a colossal statue of Caligula as the new Jupiter should be placed in the Holy of Holies in the temple. Now this was of course a fundamental threat to the core of Jewish existence and religious freedom. Sacrilege, the ultimate defilement. However, due to what Philo considered a divine intervention, Caligula met his untimely end, and Philo set himself to write a theological and historical diatribe to defame Caligula profoundly. Now, although Philo's charges against Caligula appear to have resulted from genuine fear and anxiety, his invective is very cleverly constructed. Philo's embassy to Gaius is a cunning, deliberate attempt to destroy Caligula's reputation and credibility. And Philo's method becomes clear when we apply the five pillars model of the character assassination. In the present case, the attacker and the target are apparent. In his preamble, Philo stressed the critical notion that God would not desert his people. And he finds confirmation of this belief in the concluding observation that Caligula met his end through divine intervention. God never fails his chosen people. Nevertheless, Philo must prove these claims. And that is why we see two light motives. Caligula's virulent hatred of the Jews and his claim to be a living God. Now, whereas Roman polytheism was an abomination for the monotheistic Philo, what really must have stressed him was Caligula's claim to be, and I quote, a God. And he conceives that the Jews alone are likely to be disobedient and that therefore he cannot possibly inflict greater evil or injury upon them than by defacing and insulting the holy dignity of their temple." End quote. So in a concocted speech, Philo flung it into Caligula's face how he dared to claim the insignia of the gods for himself. What hubris, what arrogance, 
a man pretending to be a living God dressed in the God's paraphernalia and demanding to be worshipped as a God. Such blasphemy must be denounced. And to do that, Philo used his quill. His book is a political tract disguised as a pseudo-historical account. And Philo's poorly disguised invective is designed as an eyewitness account of a faithful Jew who stands up for his belief and people amidst the most serious threats against their religion. And using several literary techniques, such as verbatim quotations, direct speech, invented contents of letters, disclosure of private thoughts, the abominable character of Caligula is set against the loyalty of the Jewish people towards Rome. Few examples. Philo has Caligula explain his devious schemes in extenso. He creeps into Caligula's head to express the emperor's thoughts, feelings, and motives. Philo claims to know things he in no way could possibly have known. But perhaps the best example of Philo's technique is the literal quotation of King Agrippa's long letter to Caligula to avert the danger of desecrating the temple. The letter is an anomaly in Philo's use of documentation, because he usually only referred to the content of Roman letters. But now we read a very long ad literum rendering of a document that has a central place in his story. After all, Caligula canceled his order to place a statue in the temple because of the letter. So what Philo tried to do here is what I would like to call double mirroring. I suggest that Philo used Agrippa as a mirror of himself. The sudden appearance of the king, who is unaware of the critical danger to Judaism, his collapse upon hearing the news about the statue, the content of the letter with its praise for Caligula's predecessors, the explanation of traditional Jewish monotheism, and finally, his intention to commit suicide if Caligula does not abort his plans, they are all imitations of Philo's reaction and behavior. Moreover, there is another mirroring effect. The Jewish king functions as the very antipode of the Roman emperor. So in the shape of Agrippa, Philo explicitly demonstrates the antithesis of the faithful devotee who takes a stand against the blasphemous fiend. And all this set in a clear black and white scheme of good and evil. Philo's intended audience should not be mistaken about the good intentions of the Jew. The two other aspects of Philo's invective are noteworthy. Philo brought no charges of incest or insanity. The charge of incest found its way into historiography much later, and the accusation of insanity came from the Stoic philosopher Seneca. Secondly, Philo had no use for incriminations of insanity in his schemes, because accusations of insanity can be part of character assassination, but the invective is much more effective if the scoundrel is held responsible for his heinous deeds. So if Philo had referred to Caligula as mad, he would exonerate the ruler's responsibility for his behavior and his deeds. And this would not fit in Philo's scheme of the fundamental contradistinction between good, Jewish monotheistic orthodoxy, and evil, pagan polytheism. Now, that brings us to the fourth pillar, the audience. The invective, the invective written after the assassination of Caligula, was not meant for a Jewish audience. The embassy to Gaius was a political pamphlet written for the Roman authorities, particularly Caligula's successor, Claudius. The emperor must understand that no people are more loyal than the Jews. It would therefore be a great injustice to trample upon their acquired rights. The death of Caligula had not resolved the issues which brought Philo's embassy to Rome. To incite a new ruler to decide these matters in a way favorable to the Jews, Caligula is depicted as a murderer, 
an unmitigated scoundrel, a scourge to the realm whose callous and harsh actions turned everyone's life into a joyless, miserable existence. Now, if Claudius wanted to be remembered as a benevolent ruler, he must conduct himself as the exact opposite of the dark theomaniac. Well, Claudius did try to settle the affair with a so-called tolerance edict. That is, he allowed the Jews to keep their privileges, but warned them not to disrespect other religious beliefs. But most interesting are the references in the introduction of the edict concerning the re religious rights granted by Caligula's great-grandfather, the Emperor Augustus. As the wording strongly resembled Philo's argumentation in the letter of King Agrippa. That said, the context, the fifth pillar, will be clear by now. Philo saw himself confronted with an alien world full of gods and humans pretending to be divine. Although there is some evidence that suggests how well informed Caligula actually was of Judaism and Jewish sentiments and customs, the whole affair was nothing out of the ordinary in Roman eyes. And the Romans considered the Jewish excitement and outright horror rather exotic. Placing statues in temp of emperors in temples is a perfectly reasonable and standard action. In other words, the context for Philo was utterly different from the one for the Romans and the Greeks, by the way. Now, this clash of cultures was the context in which Philo saw his very existence threatened, while Caligula merely demonstrated his imperial authority. To conclude, as a result of the disturbances between the Jews and the Greeks in Alexandria, Philo led an embassy to Caligula to plead for Jewish political and religious rights. His mission failed, whereupon Philo wrote a strong invective against Caligula, who is presented as a theomaniac and an anti-Semite. These two lines of attack were the light motives that cultivated in the affair of Caligula's intention to have a statue raised in the Temple of Jerusalem. Only divine intervention, so Philo, prevented this disaster from happening. Philo's account of the event was meant for Caligula's successor, Claudius. Philo wrote to incite Claudius to distance himself from his evil predecessor. In the end, Philo's invective was only partly successful. The matter of the Jewish religious liberty was resolved by Claudius, but the question of the civic rights remained open. The Alexandrian Jews did not gain citizenship. Nevertheless, Philo's plutonic treatment of Caligula had a long-term effect. His character assassination blew the posthumous image of Caligula to pieces. Thank you, sorry. Thank you so much for your attention. That was a really remarkable visual end to the presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much, Henri. <laughs> Um, and, and certainly seeing a lot of rhetorical strategies that we've talked about over the years in, in this, um, this invective. Fascinating. All right, Florian, talk to us. Can we hear you? I hope so. Yay! <laughs> Excellent. Let's see. So let's take another take. Uh, all right, it's so hard. the floor is it's, yours. It's hard to give a lecture after Henry von Nisbon. So, uh, well, I'll try. Um, <laughs> wait a second. Well, let's start right away. When Julia, daughter of the first Roman emperor Augustus was exiled to a small island in 2 BC, it was in various ways more than just banishment. It was a kind of cancellation and silencing. She, she, should she should never see her father and children again. Details of the scandal of 2 BC will be addressed in my lecture, but at the beginning, I will try to present a kind of typology in order to distinguish the ancient cancer culture from other practices, 
Martin told us already, because in the end we have to talk about the question of what ancient culture, can, cancel culture was or perhaps was not. But first let's talk about the art of obliteration. Killing in the name of, no matter who we name, Caesar, Caligula or Commodus or whomever, the most effective way to silence someone was of course to assassinate him or her, who must not be named. You don't have to think of Harry Potter right away, but avoiding the name is a tried and tested method of getting opponents out of the daily talk. When Augustus avoids the names of Brutus, Mark Antony, or Cleopatra in his account of deeds, when Constantine speaks only of the defeated tyrant on his triumphal arc next to the Colosseum, this reminds us very much of American presidents who speak of their predecessor only as the former president or number 45. Isolation. Ancient sources report exile as a punishment for opponents uh, during different periods. One associates this form of punishment in particular with writers such as Ovidius or Seneca, but exile could also affect other less well-known persons for a number of different reasons. Censorship. To be honest, we cannot prove systemic censorship, but in imperial times, absolute power and mass media were in the same hand. We certainly didn't have conditions like in the GDR or USSR, where political opponents were erased from encyclopedias and retouched out of photos by the dozen, but there are lots of examples. Iconoclasm. You all have before your eyes the pictures of toppled statues or the destruction of the Buddha statues by the Taliban. We also grasp similar events for the antiquity, where after the death of a tyrant, his statues are smashed sometimes in a kind of frenzy with axes and hatchets. It didn't matter if you hit the hated ruler or his statues. Book burning. You all know the pictures like this one with the book burning by the Nazis, but the ancient world knew this method too. Burning the books of unpopular writers initiated by the emperor or by a submissive senate was often, often only a follow-up punishment to the charge of high treason. Damnatio memoriae. In order to fully understand the phenomenon of a damnatio memoriae, it is necessary to understand its character. A damnatio does not, intend, does, not, does, not, does not intend to erase all memory as manifested in different images and texts of a person. It was not intended to make anyone an Orwellian non-person. It was rather a form of negative memory man management. Overwriting, rewriting, and destroying of texts and images or the manipulation of government data of the predecessor were useful and well creative techniques to dominate the memory of the past and the future. After these small clarifications and preliminary considerations, what exactly is cancer culture in antiquity? I would like to show you an example that I think meets all the requirements for this. Let's talk about Julia or Julia the Elder. Born 39 BC and died uh, AD 14. Only child of her father who divorced Julia's mother on the day of her birth. Not very nice. Grew up with her stepmother, Livia. Three marriages, five children, one died young. Death in exile after a public scandal. Such meager facts are not enough to describe a life that was so essential for the early Roman imperial period. Julia was the knot in the dynastic network of the Julio-Claudian family that was supposed to help sort out a problem. How could Augustus' power, a position of power and that of his family be perpetuated? How, when there was no son, but only a daughter, and this one from a previous marriage? Could there be, important question, could there be a dynastic succession in such a situation? And moreover, could there be a dynastic succession in a republic? 
The fact that Julia had to marry three times within 14 years with Marcellus number one, Agrippa number two, and Tiberius number three must have appeared to critical contemporaries as a clear sign of a dynastic succession, succession in the making. The enormous importance of Julia can also be seen in coinages of the year 13 BC, which bear Augustus on the obverse and Julia in the midst of her sons on the reverse. Her children played a key role. They were adopted by Augustus, placing them above all others in the imaginary line of succession. Julia's position within the family was stronger at this time than it had ever before or since. The death, the death of her second husband Agrippa in 12 BC changed her situation because now Tiberius, the second emperor, um, Augustus' stepson was forced to end his happy marriage and marry the again widowed Julia instead. Augustus ignored individual wishes and personal ties in his environment for power tactical reasons. Although the mutual rejection of the partners was too obvious, the marriage between this, his daughter and his stepson remained childless after the early death of a child and one of a distance. Tiberius in the wars in Germany, later in self-imposed exile on Rhodes, Julia with the children from her marriage to Agrippa in Italy, mostly in Rome. You see, uh, well, it could be Tiberius. Researchers believe that uh, Julia pursued her own goals from this point on. And from um, 12 or 11 BC, she was no longer willing to submit her father's or husband's dictates. According to our sources, her cycle of acquaintances became a problem for her father and husband, both morally and politically. Among them were many young men with, well, lofty political visions from influential old families, including the son of Augustus' arch enemy, Mark Antony. It was with him, of all people, that Julia entered into a relationship. Whatever exactly happened in 2 BC, we do not know. But the consequences were harsh. Julia was forced to divorce Tiberius and was convicted of adultery. In the research today, one is sure that immorality was only the concealment of a deeply political process, possibly a coup d'etat. Comparatively mild, she was only banished to the island of Pandateria, out in the sea, northwest of Ischia or west of Cape Misenum. Her mother Scribonia accompanied her voluntarily. The contact with the rest of the family was interrupted and controlled. Other people from her circle were banished, some even executed as alleged or supposed conspirators, including her lover. According to ancient authors, there were no prominent advocates for Julia, only a few voices among the people demanded a pardon. The early, the early death of her sons did not change the situation, nor did that of Augustus. The conditions of her exile are said to be, have been harsh, as you can see, it's a small remote island. She was allowed no wine, no luxurious clothing, and no male visits without explicit permission. Tiberius later tightened the conditions of her exile, cheating her out of an already modest inheritance. Her loneliness was to last a long time. It was a long wait for an expected death, after which she was refused burial in the family mausoleum. Let's look uh, to some, well, male voices, or the male character assassination. Ancient authors report different things about the family. The relationship between Julia and Augustus was good, that with Tiberius not permanently bad. Her banishment in 2 BC was due to her shameful behavior, reports the contemporary and friend of Tiberius, Valeus Patacolus. Others report, as you can see, a dissolute lifestyle repeated adulteries and immorality. Later authors take up these accusations and push them to extremes in their accounts. They explicitly report her shameless behavior, nocturnal drinking bouts and orgies on the forum, which would have brought great shame to the family. 
a conspiracy is named only by Pliny. For Augustus, it was a kind of flashback, according to Seneca, with regard to her lover, because once again, he had to fear a woman together with an Antony. Augustus is therefore said to have considered killing Julia, but Tiberius initially pleaded on her behalf. Both rejected public requests for pardon, with which implies that there were some and the public took part in the fate of the emperor's daughter. Some of you might may be reminded of the case of the missing Dubai princess, which went through the media between 2018 and 2021. Augustus is said to have said that his three children were boils and cancers. He would rather have remained without descendants. Tiberius is said to have hoped that her death would go unnoticed due to the long duration of the banishment. The image of Julia in the authors, all of whom are male, is clear. Her fate was her fault. According to the definitions of the Handbook of Character Assassinations, as mentioned a lot of times during the last 40 hours, six methods were used in the character assassination campaign of father, husband, and historiography. Name calling, making allegations, ridiculing, exposing, disgracing, and erasing, which makes Julia's fate a model case of character attacks or character assassination. Modern times. Unfortunately, we have no records of Julia, no tweets, no mails, no diary. Historical novels and films jump into this gap, emphasizing her complicity and participation, as well as her emancipation, own political ambitions or sexual self-determination. Whether these narratives are less true than the well-known ones laid out in the ancient sources cannot and should not be discussed here, but they are probably just as much a part uh, of this exciting, multi-layered, controversial, strong personality of Julia, and thus true as are the character assassinations of all these male ancient writers. There are several and quite different Julia. They are all the echoes of foreign opinions and dependent on the preconceptions of the readers of viewers. These are only just examples of um, historic novels uh, concerning uh, Julia. One of these Julia is that, is, that, is that of John Williams. In his work, her feelings are the subject of a fictional diary from which quotations are always made and which is almost a book within a book. These accounts are almost counter designs to what ancient as well as modern historians and literary figures have reported. The Julia of his diary is not loud, not shameless. Her documentation and quiet indictment is not in the form of public speeches, documents, or letters, but a private diary. Against it, he mounts the male counter voices who bring Augustus and Tiberius a series of scandalous stories that Julia is supposed to have committed. In this set, Livia is increasingly given the role of the evil stepmother in the cause of the narrative who pulls the strings behind the scenes and for whom Julia has only one meaning as the bearer of Claudian and not Julian descendants. The formerly loving father Augustus sees in her marriage to Tiberius the only chance to reconcile the oppositional old families with his will. After the publication, uh, um, after the book's publication, Williams, uh, on the right. Um, William said that uh, what he did is what historians all too often do not do, to trace the sources of human behavior. According to him, this is the only way to delve deeper into truth, at least literary truth, because apart from all historical motives, choices, and emotions, we are always dealing with imminent fictions in our sources. And sometimes, he said, you have to urge upon chaotic fact a necessary lie. Well, in the end, is there a cancel culture in antiquity? Yes, maybe, perhaps, probably, but one must at least try to separate the motives and mechanisms from all the others, even if this is very difficult. 
as with Julia. There is no conclusive answer to the question what happened in 2BC and why she was cancelled. Um, but it is obvious that there was more at stake than just amorality. The generational conflict between father and daughter, the scandal and the, well, to be honest, historiographical character assassination of her, the modern literary and cineastic attempts at redemption are all facets of one and the same event, the cancellation of the first emperor's only biological daughter, the first daughter, so to speak. And finalmente, uh, I would offer you this quote from uh, Edmond Huot de Joncourt, history is a novel that took place, the novel is history as it could have been. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you um, for another really thought provoking and fascinating uh, presentation. Um, I will invite um, uh, folks to raise their hand if they want to ask questions on uh, via audio. And I will ask the one question that has been posted in the chat already, um, which is for Florian and deals with the question of character assassination by erasure. So Arena asks, would you say that this um, character assassination by erasure was more common in the past due to more limited media availability? I noticed you said coins is the only mass media of antiquity. Um, she notes an example of a recent disappearance of a Chinese actress um, from the internet and public attacks on various Western politicians. So um, potentially the rise of digital technology and records makes it um, both harder to completely erase people, but also maybe a little easier to um, manipulate records. So thoughts on that? Whoa, <laughs> uh, two hours left. Um, well, um, as I have um, written a lot of times, um, I think it's very hard to manipulate without traces. So if you are manipulating, if you are um, we sculpturing um, a new row or a Caligula or um, a statue of a Roman emperor, you, you're always um, unnoticing these um, steps of, of the changing process. And um, the important difference between uh, Damnatio Memoria, for example, um, in antiquity and that what uh, George Orwell wrote in 1984 is um, that um, it's not a totalitarian autocratic regime um, in which uh, they were living. So there's no control um, of all, um, well, um, images and texts um, as today. So we still are um, 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 finding um, examples um, for um, national socialists um, imaginary uh, in, in Germany, even if, if it should have been destroyed in the last 17 year, uh, 70 years. Um, um, and once uh, um, in my neighborhood, they uh, discovered um, a quote um, over the entrance to, a, to an elementary school, which was used uh, between 1933 and 45. Um, and in the last 70 years, uh, lots of uh, young pupils went through this entrance. And um, well, lots of people should have noticed uh, it. So um, to sum it up, um, I think um, there's no manipulation without uh, witnesses uh, or traces. Nice, well said. Uh, Martin has his hand up. Yeah, thanks for three fascinating papers. Uh, I would actually like to ask two questions. Uh, first one for Florian, because it connects to what he was just saying, namely, you were talking about these uh, conspicuous gaps, if you will, you know, in a, when there's a Damnatio Memoriae, uh, someone is removed, but it's very clear that someone was there and they don't even try to hide it. It's perhaps rather even the point that you can see and know, oh yes, there was Caligula and now he's gone, so he's in disgrace. Um, uh, I, I would wonder, uh, and this is uh, also a question to Tyler actually, uh, how you would compare that to this, this modern 
urge to remove controversial statues, uh, because my impression is that there it's not the intention to leave a conspicuous gap and say General Lee was here, that we should really forget that the statue was ever there at all. Uh, so that would be my question to both of you, I guess. How, how do these two practices compare with one another? And my question to uh, Henri would be, uh, so you, uh, Philo writes this, this pamphlet uh, with the Emperor Claudius as his primary audience, as, as you suggest. Uh, so of course, it's very hard in antiquity to say anything about uh, how, how things are received and what impact they had. But, but is there anything we could say about uh, how this pamphlet may have impacted Claudius's decision how to deal with the Jews? Or is it impossible to say anything about its impact at all? Let's turn to Florian and Tyler first, and then we'll go to Henri. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, um, the Romans tried not um, to, to leave an, an empty space um, on their pedestals. So if they had to remove um, a statue, um, even an equestrian um, statue, they tried to fill the empty space with um, something, well, sometimes completely different uh, and sometimes um, with um, um, a new um, composition of uh, the existing um, statues. Um, Sometimes um, it was quite enough to use a well divine statue of a um, well Jupiter or Apollo or whatever god you may um, think about right now. Um, and um, the difficult thing was to um, to refill um, the gap um, in the written sources. So. If you have an inscription which could be 30, 40, 50 lines long, and you have to um, manipulate, well, three lines or four lines, um, you have to um, be very clear what you want to fill inside these um, spaces. And um, that's what they did. So um, there are examples um, that they did nothing. Um, there are examples um, that uh, they erase the wrong person. Um, there are examples um, where they did nothing, um, which is um, quite um, well. Um, it's not astonishing because you have to you have to be um, aware of that there are thousands and thousands of milestones um, along the Roman roads and. Um, if it is a road that an emperor built or reconstructed, which, um, well, um, had to be erased out of um, um, the um, um, the record um, out of the out, out of the records, um, there were some really unlucky uh, guys who uh, had That's to walk miles and miles. Uh, um, and 500 miles again uh, to, to um, well, uh, just erase one line out of thousands yeah. of milestones. But would you say that those, those images you showed it where they did leave a, a conspicuous gap, that those were rather the exceptions that they usually did try to fill it up? Well, I think it depends um, on, um, um, on the... Um, um, the place where it was, um, um, where it was. So um, yeah. you have these um, temple sculpture in Egypt, um, where they erased the emperor Geta in uh, 211. Um, it's four meters high. So there's I'm nothing sure. you can. There's there's nothing you can you can um, you can do um, to to refill. Um, the space you have just created, um, and uh, if it's um, if if it's a well milestone in in uh, in Turkey, right in the middle of Turkey, uh, two hundred and fifty kilometers away from the next city, so who cares? Um, mm -hmm. There's a gap. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so Tyler, do you think that that 
with these modern memorials uh, for the Confederacy? Uh, would they want to leave conspicuous gaps or would they want the memory to be completely erased, uh, ideally? Some, some situations lead to complete erasure more easily than others. So pull the name off the school, uh, you know, there, there was a, a situation not uh, 20 miles from where I am right now, where there was a school called Lee Elementary School, and they could not figure out which Lee it was named after. They eventually found out because there were two possibilities. There was sort of the, like the Confederate possibility, and there was another Lee who was sort of a founding father in the Oklahoma City area. But um, they eventually figured out which Lee, and you know, you you can very easily sort of erase that from the, the front of the school and all of the websites and, and so forth and come up with a new name. Um, and that can be replicated in a lot of these instances, but um, in others, I think people are looking for sort of caveats or clarifying information. So it's not as if erasure has moved to well, we've got to strip this guy from children's history books. It just becomes, uh, how do we talk about this person in a context that is like fully reflective of all that they did? In some instances, you see people saying, well, maybe we don't pull down the statue or remove the plaque, but maybe we put up a different plaque that says, mm -hmm. hey, this was a bad guy. And so, you know, when you look at a statue, you're thinking, honor. Uh, but like full context has been a way that some have sort of tried to split the baby, to put it uh, a, a yes. different way here. Um, but like some of these, some of the examples I, I gave in my talk are like really lend themselves to quick visual erasure that like give it some time and there will be mental erasure as well. I think about it in sort of a completely different context, but um, mm -hmm. the Chicago area from where I'm from uh, went through a spate in the past few years of just naming roads after people that used to just sort of be numbers. And like eventually we start using the new names and like thinking oh, only old people use numbers. Well, I think that some of that dynamic is probably potentially at play here where you can get rid of the visual and eventually the sort of what the, like the pedestal that I showed. Um, who knows how people are going to be describing that. I don't, I don't think people are gonna take, it's a beautiful pedestal, um, but who knows how people 10 years or 20 years or 50 years down the road are going to be described. Are they gonna be oh, like, that's where the, the Statue of Lee used to be, or mm -hmm. maybe they'll come up with a new name for the pedestal and yeah. people will start using that. So it, it is so, situationally dependent the extent to which erasure can be sort of fully versus clarified or modified let's say yeah thank you Henri do we know anything about the reception yeah well I, I first if I may like to react to what sure. the Florian and Tyler just said I mean, have to be careful with um, interpreting the nation memoria as erasure I mean, let's not forget that the term, the notion, the Nazi memoria, is a 19th century term. And it's a kind of uh, um, yeah, term that tries to group a lot of different measures together. And um, I, I, I very much doubt that the, the Nazi memoria, as it was used in, in ancient times, and also now, should be seen as erasure. I guess it is what it actually was, or could have been, I, I, I mean, you can't be sure about these things, but um, it, it is a sanction. So someone was, for whatever reason, and usually after his death, he was sanctioned for something that people, that and relevant people at the time thought important, and the, the victim, to, 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 to call him like that, did not live up to that. And if you realize that, it means that all these interpretations about the activities and deeds and thoughts or whatever of that person change over time. And 
as, as, as Florian said, you look at, like in the Roman Empire, you, you can't erase everything. I mean, it's simply impossible. And um, I don't think they try to erase everything. This was just enough when a sort of kind of symbolic action was made, saying, look, this guy, this woman was wrong. This person was wrong. And we should sanction him yeah, by thinking differently about what he had helped to leave, to leave behind. And that also, when you come to all to this, this removal of statues and all that, and personally, I don't think that it's, I mean, how about 10 years from now? I mean, this, this continuous changing of opinions about what happened in the past, I mean, yeah, it, it should make, make, make one more careful about every Recuperable, irreplaceable actions. Okay. Yes, thanks. Your question. Um, yeah, well, the, the, the interesting thing is that the introduction to the tolerance edict, the Claudius Tolerance Edict, um, which contained a lot of philonic thinking, was actually written. By a, the, by a former governor of Egypt, Emilius Rectus. So in one way or another, we don't know how, yeah, it is highly possible that, 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 uh, that Rectus uh, read Philo's work. It's also possible that they have been in contact in some way. I, I don't know how the situation was at that moment, but it is very, the only thing that I noticed was that <clears throat> when Rectus was, was governor, um, Claudius came with his, after Rectus resigned as governor, Claudius came with his edict and the introduction was written by Rectus and it contained a line of thinking and argumentation that, that, that immediately came out of Philo's Legatio. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> Um, so I want to forgive me, Tyler, if I'm about to put you on the spot, if you're typing an answer here, but, um, and I see Michael has his hand up, which we'll get to in a second here, but April's asking in the chat, um, I think if I'm boiling this down correctly, whether your survey was designed to permit people to kind of have a range of opinions, such as whether the statue should be removed ever under certain context versus whether um, they should be removed via a process where community members and elected representatives have a conversation about it. So was your survey designed to allow people to have, I guess, some procedural qualifications for when and how if statues are removed? So not this or this survey only asked uh, the, the removal questions in a sort of binary remove keep in place format like we like they were uh, visualized on, on the slides I went through there. Uh, the, the piece that I talked about when I started my presentation, the 2019 piece, that digs more into the how do we feel about how this is happening uh, sorts of questions. So that was another survey experiment where we we gave respondents these sort of mock news articles where we manipulated um, who was making the decision, uh, whether it was sort of like a public vote or um, whether it was sort of an elected board. And we also manipulated the, uh, the, out, the, the sort of size of the outcome. So how people would feel like a close decision to do something versus a blowout of a decision, you know, if 55% if of the public wanted to remove a, a memorial versus 90% of the, or something like that. Um, and that's where we sort of found results that revealed uh, the public was, was really sort of hesitant about not having, um, but yeah, those, those are sort of two separate tracks. Uh, but I think there really is, room for future research in this area, maybe by me, maybe by someone else, to really dig into 
like how we might use open-ended survey questions to let people express their views on these points, how we might write survey questions that offer uh, more nuanced response categories to these questions. So like there, there really are not two clear sides in a lot of these debates. There are a good number of people, like there have been some survey questions which have revealed a, a middle ground uh, that is like, well, we, we should keep these in place, but we should be clearer about who these people are, or we should take these down from the town square and put them in a museum so people can still see them um, in, a, in a sort of formal setting. Uh, but like history is important, but not pretty. So yeah, I think there's a lot of room to play around with how we ask these questions in surveys and also the extent to which we allow survey respondents to uh, share views other than just sort of clicking on buttons to answer survey questions. Um, but that's work for future research. I, I appreciate that response because it really does highlight just sort of the multiplicity of possible responses that we could have to these statues. Remove them, put them where, create different plaques, all sorts of different things are um, an option here. Um, and, as, and as someone mentioned in, in the chat, you know, like in other places in the world, there are these uh, almost like theme parks of, of old statues um, and Proposals for such things in the United States are under, you know, like there have, are, are wealthy Southerners who are proposing the same sorts of things happen. Uh, so, you know, wouldn't be surprised if in a few years you could incorporate these things into your road trips if you were so inclined. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, all right. So I'm going to let Michael ask the last question, and then we're going to hand it over to Eric, who's going to lead um, a little uh, Q or uh, conversation wrap up. Thank you, Jennifer. I uh, really enjoyed uh, the presentations uh, this morning and, and this present panel. And Tyler, I have a question. I'm particularly intrigued, horrified, fascinated in the case of Stone Mountain in Georgia. Um, and what you've heard about that in terms of public opinion, what your thoughts are about what to do about it, the largest sculpture or bas relief sculpture of its kind in the world carved into this, in this mountain face. There's proposals that maybe the whole thing could be sandblasted. Like when something is that massive and part of the natural landscape, what, what can be done? What do you think? You know, I, I tend to think that with that example, um, the like the literal geographic placement of it in the South um, is going to like we're not we we wouldn't be thinking of public opinion moving in a direction in the short term in such a way that removing that would be something that would happen in the near future. Like I haven't seen surveys of Georgians that would say like. This needs to go now. Um, you know, not, not to, it is sort of interesting though, because pub, public opinion is not necessarily, it is not as if, well, like everyone in the South and adjacent South is for keeping these things and everyone everywhere else is for removing these things. Uh, there's a good amount of heterogeneity across regions. Um, so like, I don't think this is, I, I think this is something that is going to be sort of part of the discussion in the short term, but I don't see any momentum to remove it in the short term. But, you know, like one of the reasons why some of these memorials are the size and the scope that they are is because people want these things to be lasting and they want these things to be difficult to remove. Um, yeah, like that is, it's an example of, of, of a tough one there to physically remove. Um, but it, it is the sort of example that you could see you know, 20 years down the road, we could be in a very different place when it comes to public opinion on this. It's also the sort of visible signal that, and I don't sort of know this from, from encountering it in the, in the media at, at all, but it's the sort of visible signal that could be 
susceptible to the sort of vandalism that we saw with the the Lee statue and so forth, where it is such so prominent that you wouldn't be surprised if it becomes a target in some ways for folks. Um, but yeah, that that is probably the most that would be probably the most difficult re physical removal um, out of out of anything that's out there. We'll see where we are down the road. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Thank you all for your wonderful questions and comments. This was a great way to wrap up our official um, panels for the CARP 2021 conference. So thank you again to our final three panelists and for you all for hanging around. I think that the presentations we just heard made it well worth it. I am going to officially declare then panel eight closed. And the last thing on our agenda for those who are able to stick around is a wrap up discussion and closing remarks, which will be led by Eric Shirive of George Mason University.